All right, thank you, Titus. Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to be uh, beginning to look at 1 John 4, 12 here this evening, and we'll be, gonna, we'll be talking about the invisibility of God, because John says in this verse that absolutely no one has ever observed God the Father. And then he goes on to say, if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. So we're going to... Uh, Look at this verse, uh, this, this, it's going to take us more than one evening to look at this verse because there's three different assertions here and uh, we need to take a night on each one of them. It's not, uh, I mean, I could flip through all of them, but um, it, you wouldn't get everything out of it that I want you to get out of it. So that just goes to show you that when you do like the epistles of Paul or John or Peter, you know, you could go, you know, there's, I know that we have verse markings and all that, but there's some, some verses they have like three or four assertions and each of them are very important and, and takes a little explaining to do in some of these assertions. So that's why a lot of times you'll see me take more than one evening to do a verse. However, when we go to like a big, uh, we go to like a narrative, like we've done Exodus, we've done Genesis in the past, and we took big, you know, huge, uh, big par- you know, paragraphs or even chapters, and you can do that because it was a narrative. But when you talk about uh, when you do the epistles of Paul or John or something like that, they're each verse could have more than three or four prop. You could have three or four propositions, so it's not just uh, simply one statement. A lot of times, and so we're going to be looking at First John chapter four, verse twelve. In the, this week, uh, we'll look at uh, this evening. We'll note the first assertion where it st- teaches that absolutely no one has observed God the Father, and the second one is related to it. Of course, as we'll see when we get to it. Um, tomorrow evening we'll be noting that the Father lives in fellowship with a believer who obeys the command to love one another. And then Thursday we'll be noting that God's love accomplishes its purpose when the believer obeys the command to love one another. That, that uh, on Thursday, um, your translations, uh, I think, are a little bit, um, it takes a little bit of explaining the way they translate some of the, uh, one of the words there uh, uh, in uh, verse 12. Uh, some of the translations, I, I beg to differ on the way they're translating it. So, it's going to take some explaining. To, well, I have to explain myself a little bit as to why I translate it the way I do, which you, you'll read from my translation here this evening. So uh, we'll be looking at First John chapter four, verse twelve this evening. The first assertion. So um, let's take a moment of silent prayer, and uh, we take a moment of silent prayer, of course, to examine ourselves, to get us, ourselves ready, and prepare ourselves to hear what God is going to say to us. God, the Holy Spirit, will say to us through the teaching of the Scriptures. So uh, this, is, this requires us to be in fellowship with God, and also it requires reverence and respect for the Word of God when it's being taught. And so that's why uh, you know, uh, people who come to hear me teach, I mean, unless you're, I understand that uh, there's new believers and they don't, might not understand these things and they might fidget or talk to somebody beside them. But usually when you come to hear my classes, people are listening and they're not fidgeting or looking behind them and, or talking to their girlfriend or anything like that or their wife or nudging their wife or husband or in the ribs or something, stuff like that. So um, because we, uh, it's not about simply about that past, although it is respectful to, to listen to past the bill and not be talking to somebody else. Uh, but it's uh, more importantly, it's uh, if uh, God, the Holy Spirit is working through me and he will when I'm accurately interpreting and following his guiding, guidance and direction in a passage, uh, then you better listen to him, and you're showing disrespect if you don't. And also, uh, you know, we could show disrespect for God by simply, you know, when the Word of God's being taught, by simply not um, having our thinking right and not listening to what's being taught. We, we could sit there and pretend we're listening or, you know, we're all messed up on something else, we're de- depressed about something or we're bitter at somebody and we're thinking about that. And then you're disrespecting God, even though you might look to people uh, and he, maybe even the pastor, that uh, everything's cool with you. But uh, God sees the heart. So uh, we need to um, take these things in, uh, into consideration when we take this moment of silent prayer. So it's a time that we examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins to the Father, he, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that he purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. And we maintain that fellowship by our obedience to the, the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures. And when we do that, we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's uh, anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you so much for the beautiful weather, and uh, which I like the warm weather, so thank you, Father. I just thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us and uh, your grace, your mercy, and your love that we have uh, benefited from and are benefiting from now, not just in the past, but in, right now in the present moment through the forgiveness of our sins as a result of confessing our sins to you. We thank you, Father, for the grace and the mercy and your love you'll, you'll extend to us in the future. We just thank you for your word and the things that we're learning in 1 John, and we pray that you would bless this study in 1 John and use it mightily, uh, not only uh, through the live broadcast, but through the recordings on the website or YouTube or Sound Faith, wherever these lessons are being posted. We pray that it would be a great blessing to the body of Christ and would ultimately bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ, as we apply what we're being taught. And Father, I thank you for giving me the great privilege and honor to to communicate your word to the body of Christ, and I understand the uh, the significance of this and the importance of this, and that I must have reverence and respect uh, while I'm teaching your word to your people, and I value the flock that you give me here and the people in, the, in this uh, Thompson home. We think of it ties in Jody's hospitality, and we just thank you, Father, for the sacrifices that they make and the people, not only them listening in live or, or w- watching this class live through the website as well, I thank you for each and every one of them, or those who might be viewing or listening to this class through the website, through the recordings on the website, or uh, YouTube, wherever they're posted, Father. So I just thank you for each and every one of them, and we thank you for, for those who are serious students of the Word of God that are in this ministry. And I just thank you, Father, for uh, their faithfulness and their seriousness about uh, taking seriously the Word of God. And so, Father, I just uh, consider them my, 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 my brothers and sisters in Christ, my family, true family, those who hear the word of God and do it. So, Father, I just pray that you would help me to be your instrument by the power of the Spirit, help me to accurately interpret and communicate your full counsel to your people. And your people, I pray that you would work mightily and powerfully through them as well through the Spirit. And pray the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully in helping them to understand and apply what we're being taught here this evening. We uh, pray, Father, that you would also help Titus with the sound and shine him with the sound with the recording, the video, the audio. We thank you for this service, the technology, and the people taking advantage of the technology. And so, Father, we pray that this uh, service would bring glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. You should be at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, as I've been doing, and uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to study 1 John 4, 12 in its immediate context. So that would mean that we've... Uh, We've covered uh, the verses in detail in this, uh, c- leading up to this verse, and also we're going to read forward uh, from these verses all the way to 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Uh, actually, in the Net Bible, Bible, I'll read to 1 John 5, 4, uh, but 1 John 5, 3 is where this section, this ninth major section of 1 John ends, and, where, and it begins at 1 John 4, 7. So let's look at 1 John 4, 7 in the Net Bible I'm reading from. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God because God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed in us that God has sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God resides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we reside in God, and he in us, and that he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God resides in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has in us. God is love, and the one who resides in love resides in God, and God resides in him. By, when he says resides there in the Net Bible, it's speaking of fellowship. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because just as Jesus is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears punishment has not been perfected in love. We love because he loved us first. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his fellow Christian, he is a liar, because the one who does not love his fellow Christian, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And the commandment we have from him 
is this, that the one who loves God should love his fellow Christian too. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been fathered by God. And everyone who loves the father loves the child fathered by him. By this we know that we love the children of God whenever we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments do not weigh us down because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. The uh, ESV translate verse, translates verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now, as I promised before the opening uh, prayer, uh, we're going to be, there's three assertions in this verse, and we're going to note the first one here this evening, the second one tomorrow, and the third one on Thursday. Now, when it says no one has ever seen God, the word uh, translated uh, no one in the, uh, in the Greek text, for those who are interested, is the adjective udes. And this word functions as a substantive, a noun. And it's, as, it's functioning as a substantive, as a negative reference to an entity. In our context, these entities would be human beings. And so therefore, you could translate it, absolutely no one or absolutely no person. It's an emphatic negative here. And so this is another way you could emphatically negate something in the Greek, not just ouk, but also this word udes. Now, the, the, here, the, uh, it's used of members of the human race. So therefore, this word is emphatically negating the idea that any human being has ever seen God. And uh, we'll note what seen here means. It's a little bit more uh, involved than just, you know, the function of sight. So the word for God there is referring to the Father. John does not put this word in the articular construction, which calmly signifies the Father, but rather he leaves it anathras. Anathras simply means is no article before it. Article in English is the. So when he does, when the, the writer in Greek does that, it's because in this context, he, uh, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's doing this to emphasize the quality or, or the the, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the quality or the character of this noun, which in this context the referent is God. So it's he's therefore emphasizing the nature or the character of God. And in particular, his attribute of love when he doesn't use the definite article in the Greek before this word. So this is something where uh, you don't know this in your translation, but this is something your pastor brings out. It's part of interpretation so that you can understand it. This is not the job of the translator to explain that. That's up to me. And so therefore, the translation can't do that for you. So then we have the word uh, seen. In the ESV, it says, no one has ever seen God. The word seen is stay aomai. Uh, they ah oh my, they ah they ah oh my, means to observe in the sense that it implies uh, paying strict attention to what one sees or perceives. So they ah oh my, uh, this is uh, means to observe, not just seen, uh, and it means observe in the sense that you're paying strict attention to what one sees, what you see, or what you perceive. So to observe in English is to mark or to be attentive to, to something seen and heard, and it refers to observing something carefully. So the idea here is that of intense scrutiny. This word, theaomai, uh, it means to observe, but in the sense of it having, a, it expresses the idea of intense scrutiny. So that would mean John's saying there's absolutely no one in the human race who is absolutely uh, observed to the point of scrutiny uh, God, because no one's ever seen him. No one's ever done that. So this verb is modified by the temporal adverb, popeta, and this word means to ever or at any time, since it pertains to an indefinite point of time or occasion. Now, the perfect tense of this word, theaomai, it's a gnomic perfect. You don't see these too often. Uh, it's used to speak here of a proverbial occurrence. Uh, usually, we see this with the gnomic present in English, and uh, usually you see that particular gnomic present with proverbial occurrences, like God is love, something that's true all the time. Uh, this pr gnomic perfect, is, you don't, it's very, it's not too, it doesn't occur too often. Uh, I think this is the only time I've seen it in 1 John up to this point. And here it's used, to, use of a, it's used here of a proverbial occurrence, so therefore that would express the, a, a, a general timeless fact about God the Father. In other words, he, it's expressing an eternal spiritual truth about the Father in relation to the members of the human race. What's that? Absolutely no one at any time has observed him. So look at my translation now, of 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and then we'll read uh, verses 7 through 12 in my translation, please. 
1 John 4, 7. And for those who are on the internet, uh, if you're not aware of it, you can go to our website under written library, 2000, uh, 1 John 2017, and you'll see our translation. There's an expanded translation. You don't want to, we're not going to read from that one. We're going to read from the other one. So uh, this is more, the one I, we're reading from now is more readable. The other one is a little bit more wordy, more interpretive. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let each one of us continue to divinely love one another, because this love is a characteristic originating from God. Consequently, the one who at any time does divinely love has been fathered by God, and as a result, they know God experientially. They haven't fellowship with Him. The one who at any time does not practice divine love never, never enters into knowing God experientially, because God is divine love as to His nature and character. By means of this, God's love entered into the state of being revealed because of each one of us. Namely, that God dispatched into the world with authority his one and only son in order that each one of us would conduct our lives through him. In other words, have fellowship with him. Love is defined by the means of this. By no means that we're living, uh, loving God, but rather that he himself, in contrast to us, loved each and every one of us. Specifically, he dispatched with authority his son to be the propitiatory sacrifice for each and every one of our sins. Beloved, if and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, that God loved each and every one of us in this manner, and we all agree that he did, then each and every one of us are obligated to continue making it our habit of divinely loving one another. Absolutely no one at any time has observed God if any of us at any time does divinely love each other, this God is living in fellowship with us. So in other words, you put the two statements together, uh, we can't, nobody's ever seen God, but you're having, coming into intimate fellowship, fellowship with God through loving your fellow believer in obedience to his command to do so. Consequently, his love is accomplishing its purpose in us. So notice, uh, my translation of verse 12, in fact, you look at that last, state, uh, last assertion in verse 12, is entirely very different than what my, uh, from my translation. The Net Bible, the ESV, that's why it's going to take a night to kind of explain why that is. I have to explain myself, and so it's going to take some time to do that. So that's why I couldn't cram all this verse in, into one evening. So that's uh, my translation of 1 John 4, 7 through 12. So 1 John 4, 12 contains three assertions, as I pointed out. All three, though, are designed to emphasize with the recipients of 1 John the critical importance of continuing to make it their habit of obeying the Lord Jesus Christ's spirit-inspired command in John 13, 34, and 15, 12 to love one another as he loves them. And, of course, this is applicable to us. So this, these three statements here in verse 12 are telling us here in the 21st century uh, the importance of obeying the command to love one another. If we're already doing it, they're emphasizing the importance of continuing to obey this command to love one another. So the first is uh, presented in a declarative statement, and the second is presented in a fifth-class conditional statement. And the third, as reflected in my translation, is found in a result clause. In fact, uh, my translation of these three assertions reflect everything I just said there. Now, the first assertion is a declarative statement that absolutely no one at any time has observed God the Father. And so the second teaches that if any believer does at any time divinely love their fellow believer, then God the Father is living in fellowship with them. The third asserts that God's love is accomplishing its purpose in the believer if they divinely love their fellow believer. So that's what we have with the three assertions. So there's the broad outline of the verse. So each of these assertions, we can take a night on it, and we're going to do so because each has a lot to say, uh, one about the character of God, one about fellowship with God, and one about the purpose of God in sending his son to the cross for us. So uh, there, each of these things are very important that we understand. Now, as I pointed out, the word God, theos, it's anothrous. It doesn't have an article in front of it. That's what it means, anothrous. And uh, this word refers to the Father and not the Spirit or the Son. And this is indicated by several factors. First, up to this point in 1 John, uh, this word theos is used primarily of the Father. However, it's also, as we saw in 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, it's used of the Spirit as a referent. And then, secondly, the, the referent of this word in 1 John 4, 10, 
is the father. And also the referent of this word is the father in the following fifth class conditional statement here in 1 John 4.12 that I just read to you. And lastly, John issues a similar statement in John 1.18 in which he asserts that absolutely no one has ever seen God and that the only one himself, God, who always experiences, experiences fellowship with the Father has made him known, has made God known, and that would be the Son. So we see that the context and John's statement in John 1.18, which is very similar to what we have in 1 John 4.12, written by the same guy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the, the word is, uh, God there is referring to the Father, and of course, uh, not the Son, uh, because we've see, uh, seen the Son, but seen him as a human being, uh, the human race has, and it's not the Spirit, because uh, the Spirit is not the one who was, became a human being. And uh, but uh, so he's referring to the father because of primarily because this is the way the word this God, the father is being used here in first John, primarily of the father, except for, with the exception of first John four, two to six, where it's used of the spirit. And in first John four, 12, the next statement after this first one in first John four, 12, the fifth class conditional statement uh, is uh, the father is being referred to there. Uh, and so that would indicate the context, the immediate context is telling us that uh, this uh, reference of God here in 1 John 4.12 in the first assertion is a reference to the Father. Now, uh, this is important because we're trying to understand the passage. And so we learn about a lot about the, each member of the Trinity in relation to the plan of God when we pay attention to such details. So John is asserting in this verse that the word in John 1.18, if you notice, uh, as I just pointed out, in John 1.18, John's gospel, uh, he asserts that absolutely no one has ever seen God and that the only one himself, God, who always experiences fellowship with the Father, has got, made God known. So he's asserting in this verse, John is, in John 1.18, that the word has made the Father who is invisible known to human beings by becoming a human being and living among members of the human race. Uh, hold your place. Go to John chapter 1. Look at verse 1, please. John cha John's Gospel chapter 1, verse 1. So we're going to see something here in this, in this verse. You know, he's saying... <laughs> In John's gospel, uh, he comes out, John says that the word, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God, he made explain the, who God is, his character and nature to people. And he did it in a human body. Now, uh, what, was, what was Jesus' life characterized by? The command to love one another. He loved his neighbors himself perfectly. He loved God perfectly. He loved his fellow human being perfectly. He loved those who believed in him perfectly. Uh, and he, he, he greatest sacrifice on the cross for them. But when we practice the command, love one another, those who are in union with him and members of his body, uh, and uh, when we do that, we're manifesting who God is as well to the human race, just like the son did when he became a human being. So this is very exciting. We, we, I, I pointed this out in the past. You know, we're trying to reach people with God, but we can say things and be godly things, and we could speak the word of God to people and give them truth. But if our conduct and our behavior is not in line with what we're telling them, like we talk about love and loving one another, are we doing that? Um, you know, the, I've seen this in uh, you know uh, ministries where people are very serious about the word of God, but they don't put it into practice. So basically, it's just become arrogance in them, and l love edifies. Uh, uh, at, what do you call it? The knowledge puffs up and love edifies, Paul said in 1 Corinthians. So we got to practice the command love one another. By doing that, we'll reveal who God is to members of the human race. So that means, you know, we have to get involved with people and try to interact with people. And, uh, and you know, I know some people are, are more reserved than others, and that's fine. But you are in contact with people wherever it's at work or school. So whoever you're coming into contact with, I don't mean you have to knock on doors in your neighborhood. But when you come in contact with people, how are you conducting yourself? And, and here's the other thing. How are you conducting yourself in relation to those who are in the church? And, and I'm not just saying uh, in your local assembly, you know, uh, people you're who are in this church here, how you treat them. 
I'm talking about every Christian, whether they belong to your local assembly or they go to some other church down the street. How are you toward them? Uh, how are you treating them? And that is, a, if you're practicing the command to love one another, you will be manifesting God to people who are observing you to believers interact. And Jesus said this in John 13, 34 and 35, if you love one another, all men will know you're my disciples. So look at John's gospel, chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was fully God. The word was with God in the beginning, eternity past. All things were created by him and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So he's asserting that the word is uh, the creator. He's God. And that's Jesus Christ. And him was life. And the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines on in the darkness. But the darkness has not mastered it. A man came sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light. So that everyone might believe through him. He himself was not the light. But he came to testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created by him. But the world did not recognize him. And he came to what was his own, but his own people did not receive him. That would be the Jews. But to all who have received him, those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become God's children. Children not born by human parents or by human desire, or a husband's decision, but by God. Now, the word became flesh, took up residence among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth who came from the Father. John testified about him and shouted out, this one was the one about whom I said, he who comes after me is greater than I am, because he existed before me. For we have all received from his fullness one gracious gift after another. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only one himself, God, who is in the closest fellowship with the Father, has made God known. And we know, again, God, he says in the very first assertion there in verse 18, no one has ever seen God. That's what he says in 1 John four twelve. Same thing. And he's saying, the Son, the Word of God, became a human being, and he made God known. He, some translations say he explained God. So every word, every action uh, of Jesus of Nazareth was revealing the character and nature of God, who was invisible. And, when, and, and when, he, uh, when we practice his command to love one another, we're doing the same. We're getting to it. We're explaining the Trinity. In fact, each member of the Trinity indwells us. And we're, they're looking to manifest themselves their character and nature through our lives, our words and our actions, and interacting with each other in the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ. So this is a great responsibility. It's very exciting because, listen to me, this makes life exciting. And I know we live in a culture, and I, I have to fight it too, because we live in the devil's world. And here in America, uh, we find the everyday life as boring and mundane, and people want to jazz it up and make it exciting because people are bored with this, that, and the other thing. They're bored with their marriages. They're bored with this. They're bored with their job. Where when you know these things that we're talking about here in First John, uh, in the Gospel of John, life becomes exciting because it changes the mundane into something exciting because God is looking to reach people in your periphery, at school, at work, in the home maybe, uh, in your neighborhood, through you and everyday contacts, wherever it's in a job or at school, as I said, wherever it might be. So that's exciting. That means each day is a day that God could use you to touch somebody's life and to, and to, and to, uh, to show them that they are loved and God is God's showing that, that they're loved through your actions, the way you treat them. And it could, you know, it could be anything, listening to somebody who's uh, listening to one of your neighbors who who's, uh, has a, it's got a tough job or he's in a tough situation or she's in a tough situation and you sit there and listen to them and, and talk about issues and problems that they have. You don't necessarily have to give them right off the bat the solution to all their problems because we as Christians like to do that. We like to sit there and go hammer them. This is what the word of God says. And you know, then we, we start 
shoving it down their throat. You got to take time to, uh, to talk, uh, listen to people and interact with people. Let them get comfortable with you before you start giving them godly advice. Sometimes they'll hear, you can do it right off the bat. Sometimes it takes some work and effort putting some time into it because some people think Christians are just trying to evangelize them and they don't care about them. They just like trying to get their, um, they're just talking at them and they're not really listening to them and, and, speak, and speaking to them as a human being who has got problems and difficulties and is different and unique and know they don't have their life together and they don't have their act together and they, they, they know that, so they're, they, they want to know if somebody really cares. So people, we gotta, if we show that we, if, when we show that we really care, we're practicing love, we will, show, we will show that we really care, we'll take the time and listen to people and get to know them and interact with people in our neighborhood. And uh, because, the, the, as Jesus said, the harvest is, uh, is ripe. Now, that doesn't mean... That doesn't mean everybody will become a Christian because you practice love with them and you treat them in a godly fashion. Probably more often than not, you probably won't get a response. But that doesn't stop, it shouldn't stop you from practicing these things because uh, you might be in an area which uh, you might be practicing, you might be pl- planting seeds. You know, the, thing, the way you treat people now, they might not come to your church and might not listen to you, but they might... They might, you, got, you might plant the thought there in their head. And maybe somebody else, another Christian, will come by and water that seed that you planted when you practiced love toward them and you treated them in kindness and love and try to uh, and empathize with them and, and try to help them in their, in their life and be a friend to them. So when John speaks of, absol- uh, when he, uh, in, in, first, in John's Gospel, chapter 118, in that verse, John asserts that absolutely no one has ever seen God and that the only one himself, God, who always experiences fellowship with the Father, namely the Word, who has made God known, the invisible God known. He's asserting in John 1.18 that the Word has made the Father who is invisible known to human beings by becoming a human being and living among members of the human race. So we can do that too. We can can reveal who God is in our lives when we practice the command to love one another. And that's what John's saying in 1 John 4, 12. So go back now to 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. And if you could look at my translation again, 1 John 4, 12. First John 4, 12. Reading from my translation, absolutely no one at any time has observed God the Father. Now, as we pointed out, the word observed there, theaomai, uh, the, um, th- that word is uh, speaking of the Father, uh, speaking of uh, John saying in this verse, when, uh, when John speaks of absolutely no one as having theaomai observed the Father, he means that absolutely no member of the human race has the ability to pay strict attention to God the Father through the faculty of sight. The idea, again, as we pointed out earlier, is that of intense scrutiny of the person of the Father. And he also asserts that never at any time has this taken place among members of the human race. Now, this first assertion is obviously teaching that God the Father is invisible. So we're going to spend the rest of the evening talking about the invisibility of the Father. The invisibility of the Father is mentioned by Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verses 17 through 23. And it's also mentioned by John, as we just read, and John 1.18, and also by Paul in Romans 1.20, also in Colossians 1, 15 and 16, all books that we've studied, including the Exodus passage. 1 Timothy 1, 17 and 6, 16, we've noted those uh, passages. We studied those books in detail as well. All of them mention the invisibility of God, the Father. And also Hebrews eleven twenty seven does as well. So let's take a look at some of these verses. Look at Exodus chapter 33, please. Exodus chapter 33. Look at, look at, we'll start at verse 7. Exodus 33, 7. Now I'll be reading from the Net Bible, though in my notes I have the ESV translation of Exodus 33, 17 through 23. We're going to read from the Net Bible over here in class. So it says in Exodus chapter 33, verse 7, we studied this book in detail. Great book. Moses took the tent, 
Exodus 33, 7, Moses took the tent and pitched it outside the camp. That's the tabernacle. At a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. Anyone seeking the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. And when Moses went out to the tent, all the people would get up and stand at the entrance to their tents and watch Moses until he entered the tent. And whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people would see the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people, each one at the entrance of his own tent, would rise and worship. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face, the way a person seeks, speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, did not leave the tent. So Moses spoke to him face to face, but that doesn't mean he saw his face. Then it says in verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you have been saying to me, bring this people up, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. But you said, I know you by name, and also you have found favor in my sight. Now, if I found favor in your sight, show me your way, that I may know you, that I may continue to find favor in your sight, and see that this nation is your people. Now, he's talking to the Father here. How do we know that? Because the next statement. And the Lord said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, the presence is the pre-incarnate Christ it was when we studied this. So the Father is called Lord there, just like the Son is now, and the Spirit. And so the Father's talking to him, and he says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, the presence there is uh, speaking of, the, of the, the second member of the Godhead. And uh, look what he goes on. In, 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 uh, he's mentioned, or, uh, let me see if he, if he does this. Yeah, I'll show you in a second. But there's, the context will in, indicates that he's God too, the presence. So verse 15 says, And Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not take us up from here. For how will it be known then that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not by your going with us so that we will be distinguished, I and your people, from all the people who are on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have requested, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before your face, and I will proclaim the Lord by name before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But he added, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. You will station yourself on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now there's a passage Going back to the, the presence there, and of course, let me see if I can find it here. There's another passage which talks about the presence there. Uh, uh, let's see, where is it? Um, oh, let's see. Yeah, maybe it's in Exodus 35. Yeah, because he, he, in the passage, he, uh, he basically says that um, the presence will forgive sin. You know, he, he ascribes all the attributes of, of, the, of the Lord to this presence. And I can't find the passage in here for the life of me. Maybe it's, maybe it's not translated presence everywhere by the net Bible. They probably did that. I don't know. So anyways, that's not the reason why I sent you this passage. But the presence... We studied this when we did Exodus. It's speaking of the pre-incarnate Christ. So here, that's a passage where it talks about the invisibility of God. He can't see his face. Um, there was, Moses couldn't uh, see God's face. And uh, let's go to another one. Look at, uh, it talks about the invisibility of God. Let's look at uh, Paul, the passages in Paul. Look at uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18.
Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. Because what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. Now, there's the concept flowing through this verse again. God's invisible, but his attributes, like his wisdom and his, uh, and his eternal power, are manifested by the things he has done, his, what he's made, created. Okay. Now, again, John, we studied with, in 1 John 4, 12, that God's love, his attribute of love, is manifested through the function of this love in our own lives when we obey the command to love one another. So look at Colossians now. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians Colossians 1.15, he, in context Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. So notice, he is the image of of the invisible God. God is in, uh, invisible. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Look at verse 17. 1 Timothy 1:17. 1, now you remember when we did, you talk about the invisibility of God. Do you remember the passage in Exodus? When the, the elders of Moses came up with the elders of Israel in the Mount Sinai and they saw God, it says. Remember that? <laughs> like, I mean, it was a, like a, a, his throne and everything. So I don't know if anybody remember that, that, that passage. It's quite interesting. So which like, is the scripture contradicting itself? It's not. That was a cool passage. Anyways, go back and listen to the Exodus series and we explain all that. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the eternal king, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, so there's a doxology by Paul there. But notice he, 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 uh, uh, Paul ascribes invisibility to God the Father. Now, uh, I want you to go back um, now, you don't have to go back right now. Uh, stay where you are. Now, back in his, to John, the Apostle John. In his writings, uh, the Apostle John makes four declarations concerning the nature of God. Some of you, if you remember our study of 1 John, you might remember some of these. Uh, one, God is love. 1 John 4, 8, John says, God is love. Then he also says in 1 John 1, 5, if you recall, that God is light, which is a figure for the holiness of God. Uh, some uh, some uh, say it's a figure for the truth. And uh, I went into that and, and when we did that first, and it's in our written PDF document on the website, and I went into the reason why it's not speaking of his holiness. Then the third assertion in John's writings, not just his, not first, second, and third John, but also the Gospel of John. God, He says God is spirit. He says that in John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And then number four he says that God, as to his nature, is invisible. That's in John 1.18, which we read earlier. It's also mentioned in John 5.37, the Gospel of John, and 6.46, as well as 1 John 4.12, the, 
our verse. Now, as we pointed out in John 1.18, the apostle John taught that Jesus Christ explained God the Father who is invisible. There would be no manifestation of God to man without the incarnation. So the Son of God becomes a human being, and one of the purposes of doing so, becoming a human being, one of the purposes thus of the incarnation, is that he came to explain who God is. And the, the writers of Scripture put it down in writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and explaining, giving us the information we need, not exhaustively of what Jesus did, but what we need to know to know that he is God, and this is what God is like. This is, wasn't there a song in the 90s? Uh, what if God, what was it? Doesn't, maybe remember, somebody remembers that song. Uh, it's too young for shining. It was, I think it was in the 90s, and this girl said, you know, what if God was one of us, I think it was called. Remember that song? And I was, every time I hear that song, I go, he did become one of us. <laughs> he became a human being, yet without sin. And so, and I think the song is kind of like, you know, I wish we could, I wish we could come into contact with God. Isn't God trying to, you know, I'd like to God to, I want to meet God. Well, you know what? People can meet God through you. What do you think we're talking about? God, people can meet God through you. Now, we might, when, isn't the Trinity in us? Isn't the character and nature of God? Don't we have partakers of the divine nature? Isn't this what we're, supposed, we're trying to manifest God's love through obedience to the command to love one another? That's God using us, working through us. He's using our hands, our feet, our eyes, our mouths, our tongues, our bodies to reach people and to show people who he, who he is. So he is, he's reaching out to the human race just like he reached out to us and we came into contact with him. He wants to use us to come into contact with others. Somebody came in, you came into contact with, uh, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a neighbor, friend, uh, or someone at school, at work, who gave you the gospel. You came into contact with God through that person. And now you became a believer, you're a child of God now, and you have the nature of God in you, and you have the command to love one another given to you, and now you can, you can communicate who God is to people. They can basically meet God through you. Yes. We're the body, members of the body of Christ, and Christ is the head. So God's trying to use us to reach people. So God has revealed himself in creation. We just read that. He's revealed himself through his son and he, in history. He's also revealed himself through the many miracles he did, like with the Exodus generation. Uh, he's revealed himself through Old Testament saints like Daniel we saw. Uh, he's revealed himself through the word of God, the written word. But he's also revealing himself to, to, to people, the human race, through us when we're obedient to his word. In particular, the command to love one another. So there would be no manifestation of God to man without the incarnation. Um, look at uh, uh, John's gospel, chapter 14. Look at verse 1. John 14, 1. Do not let your hearts be distressed. You believe in God, believe also in me. There are many dwelling places in my Father's house. Otherwise, I would have told you, because I'm going away to make ready a place for you. And if I go and make ready a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you may be too. That's the passage on the rapture we've been studying in our Sunday classes. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's why we say Christianity, uh, biblical Christianity, is exclusive, not inclusive. Uh, That means not all roads lead to Rome. Or in other words, not all the world's religions are truth. In fact, they're all lies. Only one is the truth, and that's biblical Christianity. So I say biblical Christianity because some people have Christianity that's not biblically based. They call it Christianity, but it's not based upon the teacher in the scripture. Verse 7, if you have known me, you will know my father too. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. You've seen him through me. See, Philip said, Lord, show us the father and we will be content. And Jesus replied, have I been with you for so long and you have not known me, Philip? The person who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you, believe, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father residing in me 
performs his miraculous de- de- uh, deeds. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not believe me, believe because of the miraculous deeds themselves. So uh, there's another passage that talks about the invisibility of God. Jesus is saying, I reveal God, my Father, who's invisible. He has seen me, seen me, has seen the Father. Now, the invisible, well, come, come to the end of the, uh, coming to the end of the class, uh, let's note some invisible attributes of God, the attributes of God. They're all invisible. One, uh, sovereignty of God. I memorized these. I used to teach the kids in the prep school when I was at uh, Prairie View, uh, GBC, and I used to, you know, me- I memorized these, these like 10 attributes of God, and I would have the kids do these, remember these as well. But what are the attributes of God? Because these attributes help to compose who God is, and they're invisible. So, uh, one, we have the sovereignty of God. That's an invisible attribute of God. Also, number two, God's righteousness. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're all righteous, just like they're all sovereignty. Uh, Also, number three, justice. God the Father is justice, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. Number four, God is love. That's another invisible attribute of God. We've been talking about that in 1 John chapter 4. Number, a fifth attribute of God is eternal life. And uh, this life is fellowship with the members of the Trinity. It's not just no beginning and no end. It's not just the temporal aspect of it. It's a particular quality, quality of life. It's, inter, it's fellowship with the individual members of the Trinity. Number six, omnipotence is an invisible attribute of God. Paul mentioned that in Romans, as we pointed out, chapter one. Number seven, uh, God's omniscience. He has all knowledge of all the facts both the actual and the possible. And uh, so he knows everything about our lives in great intimate detail. He knows us better than ourselves. And number eight, God is omnipresence. He is everywhere present. Uh, in fact, he, he's in hell. You think about that. They're facing the unbeliever, is in the lake of fire forever, and he's there. Because to face the, his wrath in the lake of fire, God would have to be present. So God is ex- he's not, they're not having a relationship with God or a fellowship with God, but he's exercising his wrath against them, his righteous indignation for their rejection of Jesus Christ. So he's everywhere present. There's not a place where God's not. You, know, you're, you're really, we are truly never really alone. And then number nine, another attribute of God, and not often talked about by people today, is immutability. God never changes. Uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the writer of Hebrews says. I think it's in Hebrews 13. So then lastly, a a final attribute I'll give you is veracity, truth. God is truth. Uh, That's mentioned in 1 John 5, 7. We'll see that in the future. It's also mentioned in John 14, 17, John 7, 28, and John 1, 14, and 14, 6. So God is truth. So these are all the different invisible attributes of God. And I like to say this from time to time. I, uh, uh, I learned to take these attributes of God. It's called divine essence rationale. And you take the different attributes of God to solve your problems. And uh, so, for instance, uh, when we have adversity hit our life, we could always remember that God is sovereign, okay? And he sovereignly decreed that those events in my life that are uh, tragedies, good times, bad times, Everything, every event and circumstance in my life, he's decreed for te- to happen. And he's sovereign and he's in control of my circumstances. He's, he could take me out of it at any time and he could leave me in it, whatever he wants to do, but he's in control of my situation. Not the devil, not other people, God is. So there's a, an example of divine essence ras- rationale. So you can comfort yourself by the sovereignty of God. Also, uh, you know, righteousness. God will always do right by us. He's justice. He never, he never does anything wrong to us. He, never, he always has our best interests of in mind, which leads us to the, the fact that he's love. God loves us. And if he loved us when we were his enemies, by sending his son to the cross, now that we're in his family and the objects of his love and his children, how much, how is, is he going to freely give us all things? Like Paul says in Romans 8.32. Yes, comfort yourself with these things. Learn to think that what the Bible says about God's character and nature to solve your problems. And we can't, you know, we, many times, of course, because we emote, we get, we get emotional, we all do this, we're human beings. But we should get into the practice of, de- uh, of dealing with our situations with God's divine essence rationale. Uh, meaning, uh, take the attributes of God individually and apply them to your circumstance. See how they apply. Uh, also, God's omnipotence. He's all-powerful. 
right now, we're experiencing the omnipotence of God. Everything, is, everything in the time, matter, space continuum is held together by his omnipotence. We're speaking right now because of, of his power. We're interacting with each other. Uh, we have these bodies because of his power. Uh, we're going to be raised from the dead by his power. We had souls uh, to think and make decisions because God in his omnipotence created us and his wisdom. Also, God's everywhere present. So if, if you're alone, uh, alone and you're no human companionship, God's there. He's always there. He's never, there's never a time that God was never around you. You're just not aware of his presence because of whatever reason, sin, or you know, and not, that's the main reason. But he's always there. It's, we forget about that he's always there because we forget that, uh, that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. So God is right here with us right now. And the other thing is he indwells us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're never really alone. We might be devoid of human companionship. You know, we might be like Paul, uh, you know, arrested and thrown into the Mammotine dungeon and waiting your execution at the hands of Nero. But he knew God was there with him in the dungeon. Just like Daniel knew when he was in the lion's den. God was with him, whether he in Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were thrown in the flaming furnace, even if God wasn't going to save their lives, spare their lives, they knew that God was there with them, whether they lived or died. And then we take, let's take the immutability of God. God never changes. People change, good for the best, for the better, or for the worse, but God never changes. Your spouse, your husband or wife might change. Your kids might change in their attitude toward you. Um, your, your parents might change in their attitude toward you. Your friends might change in their attitude toward you. But God will never change in his attitude toward you. He loves you. You're his child. You're the apple of his eye. He'll do anything for you. And he has done the, the most, made the greatest sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, so that you could have a relationship and a fellowship with him. And then lastly, truth. God is truth. God will never tell us a lie. We like to... We like to listen to lies about ourselves and about our circumstances. We like to deceive ourselves, and we like to listen to lies many times because we, we, we deceive ourselves. We'd rather, we're mad at God and reject God, so we go to the lie because God can't give us anything but the truth, and his truth is in his word. And so God will always, you know, what truth is, is reality. God is reality. Um, this, 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 what we want, need in our lives is the reality about ourselves. We're sinners and we need him. We need a savior. We believe in Jesus as our savior. Well, we're still of a sin nature and we're creatures of God. We've been saved and redeemed for his purpose. So the truth of the matter is we're his servants and we should function to do his will and be, that should be our, our absolute goal in life, not to get rich or to get a lot of money or get in the approbation of people. No, it's or to get 50 followers, a thousand, a million followers on Twitter. I mean, ridiculous. No, what really, really matters is doing God's will. That's a true success. That's, that's veracity. That's solving your problems with insecurity and, uh, you know, defining yourself. You do it through God's word. He'll give you the truth about yourself. You're, you're in union with Christ. You have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus uh, you might not be rich, you might not have a wife, you might not have a kid, you might not have a home, you might not have a big salary, but God's still saying these things about you, and he, that's the reality of the situation. All these things are temporal and transitory and are going to pass away eventually. The reality is the invisible, but the real is what we need to get latch on to. And so that's, you know, uh, that's truth, that's veracity. The devil's world will tell you lies. Uh, they'll tell you all kinds of lies. Uh, they'll tell you sweet little lies, like the song says, you know, Fleetwood Mac. And that's all they can give you. And when you live a lie, there's misery. And there's also destruction, discipline for a believer, and uh, sent unto death, ultimately, if you don't want to repent. And for a non-believer, it's the lake of fire. So we, we're, we're to solve our problems with truth, veracity. And God will, can only give us the truth. He will only tell us the truth about ourselves and he'll never lie about himself to us as well. So in other words, if there's one thing you can hang your hat on is God's word, which is truth. So that's, uh, um, if you could go back to uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, and we'll close. All right. 1 John 4, 12. Look at my translation of that verse, please. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12.
1 John 4, 12, absolutely no one at any time has observed God. If any of us at any time does divinely love each other, this God is living in fellowship with us. Consequently, his love is accomplishing its purpose in us. Now, this first assertion for, in 1 John 4, 12 sets up the contrast with the believer who obeys the command to love one another, since the second assertion states that the Father who is invisible is living in fellowship with them. So, yeah, God's invisible, but if we're obeying this command to love one another, we're meeting God. We're coming into contact with him. We're having intimate fellowship with him, and that should be exciting. The most exciting thing in the world, really, people, is fellowship with God. It really is. Meeting God, personally encountering God, gaining more practical wisdom and knowledge, more of the character of Christ, that's the most exciting thing, having fellowship with God. And you can't have fellowship with God apart from his word. God's communicating with us by the Spirit, through the Word, and when we obey what He says, like the command to love one another, we're having fellowship with Him, who is invisible. Well, we'll pick this up uh, tomorrow evening and continue with our study of 1 John 4.12. So let's bow our heads in prayer and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study Word. We pray that this lesson would be a great blessing to your people and touch the hearts of your people and help them to humbly and carefully consider what they've been taught in this service here this evening. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.